Uh, today's topic and theme will be looking broadly at energy outlook in the Americas. Uh, my name is Alexander Gocho, and I'm with the Jack D. Gordon Institute of Public Policy. And we are joined today by some of the most prominent thought leaders and industry professionals in the energy sector today. So today's panel will be about 75 minutes long with 15 minutes at the end allotted for Q&A. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat and we'll do our best to address them during the Q&A session. Additionally, our panel has simultaneous Spanish translation for those who prefer to listen in Spanish. And I'll try to translate that in Spanish. Para aquellos que prefieren escuchar en español, este panel tiene interpretación en vivo en español. Puede seleccionarlo eligiendo la opción de interpretación en la parte inferior de la pantalla. And now I will introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Edward Glam. Dr. Edward Glab is the director of the Global Energy Security Forum and has over four decades of experience in the energy field, including 25 years as an international business executive in the oil and gas, coal and mineral sectors. Dr. Glab is an expert on various aspects of the global energy industry, including political risk analysis and government relations. He has conducted business and academic work in every country in Latin America and dozens of others around the world, from Asia and Africa to Europe and Australia. Dr. Glab speaks Spanish and has published in the areas of energy, Latin American politics, and communications. So without further ado, Dr. Glab, please get us started. Okay, thank you so much, Alex. Uh, I think we wanna jump right into the presentations of this distinguished panel. Our first speaker is going to be David Vaught. He is the managing director of IPD, which is a group uh, of energy sector experts in economics, finance, government relation, and regulation in general, all specifically related to the Latin American oil, gas, and power industry. So we're going to hear from a real world person involved in the daily business of this, uh, where the rubber meets the road and not academic at all. So David, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Dr. Glavin. Thanks, Alexander, for the chance to join you all today. It's a fantastic pleasure to be with Benigna, Francisco, and Jeremy. We've all been working together in Latin America for more than maybe I'd like to remember, but uh, it's, it's been over 20 years, and it's been great to, to share with all of you. Uh, I, I guess it, it's going to touch upon me and, and, and Francisco to talk a, a little bit about Venezuela today. And you know, given uh, all of the uh, press and, and social media around uh, the potential for sanctions reform, uh, I really wanted to take an opportunity to talk about um, some of what we think are the important nuances here. Uh, and first, maybe just start off with a, a brief history uh, to get a better understanding of Venezuelan production. Um, Venezuela was producing about 2.85 million barrels a day when Nicolas Maduro assumed the presidency in 2013. Uh, when petroleum prices plunged uh, in the last quarter of 2014 and uh, even further through 2016, from about $100 a barrel to $25 a barrel, crude output was negatively impacted. Um, by, I guess what you could call really a perfect storm of low prices, which really curtailed Pedevesa's ability to spend any CapEx, um, management efficiencies uh, in, in the industry. Uh, uh, obviously, the CapEx decline resulted in a decline in service company activity. And then all of this was mixed up with the implications of Venezuela's dissolving socio-political environment, which had a real material impact on PDVSA and on oil industry operations. So essentially what you had at the time was mounting structural issues um, <clears throat> that were pushing crude output downward. And then a wave of sanctions issued between August 2017 and August 2019 uh, essentially exacerbated an already bad situation. Uh, so those sanctions started off with sort of uh, uh, limitations on financing and debt repayment. Um, they continued uh, through to the inclusion of PDVSA and the Venezuelan Central Bank on OFAC's SDN list. 
um, and and then sanctions on the government uh, later were issued, and 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 uh, the particularly the sanctions of August 2019 were pretty broadly written, and they 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 gave pause for uh, the the non-U.S. persons working in Venezuela who said, oh, now it looks like maybe there could be secondary sanctions handed down. We're going to uh, reevaluate our business in the country. Uh, so sanctions have had an impact. However, it is really difficult to measure, at least in the early days, with any precision what that impact was. For example, in January of 2019, when uh, PDVSA was uh, sanctioned and the central bank was sanctioned, only a couple months later in March, Venezuela had multiple national blackouts that actually took production down by about a million barrels a day for several weeks. Okay, <clears throat> when production was resumed, uh, output stabilized at about 300,000 barrels below pre-outage uh, output or uh, uh, volumes. Um, and, and there we see, okay, we've got uh, sanctions on one hand, we've got this major structural problem on another, and how do we account for what's what? How do we account for what's really causing production to fall? That wasn't so easy. Um, over the next two years, uh, sanctions forced a sort of disorganized adjustment of PDVSA's operating and, and trading activity, uh, forcing production shut-ins as fewer tankers were available to lift crude, um, and also diluent supply, diluent which was imported uh, <clears throat> uh, for heavy oil production in the Orinoco oil belt was interrupted. Um, India's reliance uh, at the time was supporting PDVSA with crude marketing and with supply of, of diluent. Once it recognized that uh, secondary sanctions uh, could become a problem, it, it, it was clearly interested in bringing itself into compliance and it pulled out of the market. It was replaced by Russia's Rosneft, which picked up on that marketing of Venezuelan crude, providing tankers, providing facility to ship crude to China. Um, <clears throat> but then Rosneft was sanctioned uh, by the Venezuelan government. TNK Trading, uh, and I should say Rosneft Trading was sanctioned by the Venezuelan government. TNK Trading came in after that, was also sanctioned. And essentially by July 2020, uh, output had tanked at about 400,000 barrels a day. So where are we today? Uh, uh, eventually, PDVSA was able to replace the sanctioned Russian traders with what many in the industry are calling phantom traders, um, you know, uh, uh, briefcase companies that have made deals with PDVSA to move PDVSA's oil uh, to primarily uh, China. They've taken advantage of a great opportunity to charge exorbitant fees uh, to transport Venezuela crude to, to China, uh, forcing PDVSA to accept major discounts as transportation costs and complex redocumentation charges really add to the total cost of, of, of shipment, which is absorbed by PDVSA. Um, <clears throat> so now let's move to sort of uh, last month. Um, Venezuela produced just short of 700,000 barrels a day in September. The phantom traders continue to operate. They're sending about 95% of current Venezuelan production to China. Uh, Iran has entered into the picture um, over the last year. They've, been, they've provided in excess of 22 million barrels of condensate and light crude for uh, both uh, the purposes of blending extra heavy oil and for feedstock for Venezuela's uh, refineries. So um, today, uh, what we're hearing in the press is the United States is preparing to uh, create some sort of flexibility within its sanctions regime. Some people are saying the United States is considering lifting sanctions. No, that, that's not true. There's going to be no lifting of sanctions. Um, what there is hopefully going to be is a recalibration of sanctions. Um, and uh, I, I think that U.S policymakers have come 
to the realization that the original goal of sanctions, which was to push a democratic transition, has yet to materialize. And, uh, and, and the difficulty uh, extending uh, further in time could cause more harm than good. And I, and I think that that's what I'd like to focus on next would be sort of the unintended consequences of sanctions and why we agree that this recalibration is, is, is really a useful uh, exercise. <clears throat> and I, I guess the first point I'd like to make here when we talk about a recalibration is the fact that it's necessary from an infrastructure perspective. Venezuela's oil infrastructure is not being maintained. Uh, parts and equipment in the field are being stolen by organized criminal gangs. Uh, entire drilling platforms are being dismantled. Uh, maintenance in the refining and other sectors are uh, causing accidents, um, refinery explosions, <clears throat> oil spills, pipeline explosions that are threatening the environment and even threatening human life. Um, so uh, we think that the private sector is in a better position to preserve Venezuela's oil infrastructure. And in fact, the private sector is involved in joint ventures, which are producing <clears throat> around 50% of Venezuelan crude. So this is material, okay? And we, we do see some people concerned about, uh, oh, if we give the private sector a license, how does that, that, that makes improvements for the private sector, but it doesn't help humanitarian aid. It doesn't help the Venezuelan people. I would argue that it does. Uh, first of all, there's a better chance that the private sector will maintain infrastructure to support the Venezuelan economy for future generations. A complete implosion of the industry or zeroing out production will only result in the loss and, and in some cases the permanent loss of commercially viable reserves. And it will also increase the cost to repair the industry going forward. Um, the private sector, you know, with this 50% stake in overall production is in a much greater position uh, to ensure the integrity of operations, uh, ensure a safer and uh, more stable work environment uh, for the Venezuelan people working in the oil industry. So I think there we see a benefit uh, for the, the Venezuelan people. It's much harder to qualify what the humanitarian aid is going to be, but in a more transparent environment, <clears throat> and we'll get into further transparency in just a second, um, we, we, will, we will see um, that, uh, that there are humanitarian benefits and that there are uh, transparency benefits. So next I'd like to um, talk a little bit about maybe pivoting Venezuela geopolitically. And here, I think we can talk about exports to China, we can talk about imports from Iran. So with 95% of Venezuelan crude exports going to China at heavily discounted rates, I think there's value in creating optionality for Venezuela to divert crude from China to the Atlantic Basin. Here, promoting improved regional security, regional energy security, particularly for uh, the European market. Again, when we talk about this move to the private sector, we talk about more transparency and transactions, uh, being able to view exactly where cash flow is, is moving. Um, and we talk about minimizing shipping risk. Uh, tankers, actually the majority of tankers leaving Venezuela currently leave with their AIS or their global positioning beacons off. This creates environmental risk, it creates maritime risk. And these are things that could start to be mitigated with increased private sector participation. <clears throat> of course, there's the issue of, um, uh, you know, the United States interest in pivoting uh, Venezuela away from Iran. Uh, Venezuela's dependence on Iran is growing um, in terms of uh, diluent uh, supply, in terms of supply to the refineries. Here's an interesting piece of trivia. 68% of Venezuela's Orinoco oil belt production, which ranges you know, from 400 to 500 barrels uh, a day in recent months, 
is produced with imported diluent. So that means 68% of Orinoco oil belt production is being produced with Iranian crude. You know, this is something that I think people really want to take into account, uh, the, the geopolitics of, of the, uh, the, the geopolitical consequences of the current sanctions regime. And finally, since I know that uh, my colleagues are, are going to branch out this conversation into uh, other countries in Latin America, their ability to export energy, et cetera. Um, I thought that maybe I'd talk just a little bit about two things, um, uh, environmental consequences of sanctions and Venezuela's eventual uh, role as, a, as an exporter of energy. And this comes with the gas sector. Uh, and I think first and foremost, um, it's important to understand that Venezuela is currently flaring 2.5 billion cubic feet a day of natural gas. <clears throat> uh, the country is the number seven uh, globally in terms of gas flaring and venting, and it's the number one in terms of flaring intensity, or basically the amount of gas that is flared per barrel of oil produced. This is an environmental disaster. It has to be a priority that pretty much everyone in the international community will agree should be addressed. Uh, Venezuela has 200 TCF of natural gas reserves. Of course, the vast majority of those are associated with oil production and therefore cannot be uh, uh, exportable uh, uh, necessarily. But um, our assessment is that within three years, Venezuela could be producing enough to supply Trinidad's Atlantic LNG train one um, at uh, about 3.3 million tons per annum uh, through both the uh, Dragon offshore field and through gas collection in the northeastern part of the country. Um, uh, I think this is a great opportunity to look at ways to, again, pivot the Maduro administration to the West. And uh, as, as my colleagues are, are, are going to suggest, with uh, you know, every uh, other country in Latin America, the potential uh, to supply energy uh, to the Atlantic Basin is very interesting. And uh, I, I think I would really like to uh, take into account this potential for, for Venezuela. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, hopefully Francisco will sort of uh, pick up on anything that I might've missed uh, in, in, in the overview of Venezuela and, and head into his assessment of, of uh, other regions as well. Thank you. Okay, David, thank you very much. For those of you who might have tuned in a little late, uh, we just heard from David Vaught, who's the Managing Director of IPD. And now we're going to turn to uh, Dr. Francisco Monaldi, who is a fellow in Latin American Energy Policy and Director of the Latin American Energy Program at the Baker Institute at Rice University. Uh, he's also been a fellow at Columbia University, at Harvard's uh, Kennedy School, and Tufts University. So we're very happy to have him with us today. And uh, Dr. Minaldi, the microphone is all yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it is uh, a pleasure uh, being again in an activity with uh, FIU and with uh, my friends and, and colleagues uh, that, as David said, we know each other from a, from a long time. So what I plan to do today is first uh, be, give an overview of how the oil sector uh, is going to be uh, you know uh, moving in, in the next uh, a few years in the region and then go a little bit deeper on, on Venezuela uh, although you know David said most of, uh, of the important things I think. So just let, let me just uh, show you the what has happened with the oil sector in Latin America. So Latin America's oil production has been declining it didn't go up during the booming years. In fact, it went slightly down if you look, go back to the early uh, 2000s. Uh, and it went down since the decline in the price of oil around 2014 uh, 15. And uh, as uh, you would imagine, there are striking differences between the performance of different countries in terms of oil production, whereas Brazil uh, became the largest oil. Uh, producer in Latin America, producing close to 3 million barrels of oil per day. Uh, Venezuela, in Venezuela and Mexico production declined very significantly. In Venezuela, as David explained, it collapsed, and I will talk about that later, but in Mexico too, 
there has been a very significant uh, decline. And in most other countries in the region with a big potential production either stagnated or declined, like it was the case of, uh, of Argentina. In, in Colombia, it initially went up with, with the decline in the price of oil and the lack of uh, ad addition to reserves, uh, it, went, uh, it went down and Colombia is likely to continue down. So I will be that now focusing on the players that, that have uh, more, more, more potential. Here you can see sort of the comparison between the different countries in, in uh, 2021. Uh, and uh, here you, you see the beginning of what is gonna be a major player, with, which is Guyana, that produce about 110,000 barrels per day um, uh, last year, but is producing uh, upwards of 300,000 and it will go much, uh, uh, much higher than, than that. Uh, but the, the region uh, has a legacy, a legacy of uh, the reason why production has not uh, performed so well uh, in the region, except perhaps for uh, the case of Brazil, is because of what we typically call above ground risks in the, in the sector, meaning, uh, you know, the, the mix of regulatory expro expropriation risks, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, mismanagement of the national oil companies and the like that has uh, made this region that concentrates the second largest resource base outside of the Middle East uh, a significant underperformance, uh, underperformer in contrast, for example, to uh, North America, I mean, particularly US and Canada, uh, putting Mexico in the Latin America category. Uh, and, and here you can see in part why, I mean, the legacy of the expropriations and changes in contracts and the like in the region has uh, made uh, some of these the countries in the region among the worst. Uh, you can see that in that table, the, the, the world ranking a survey of, uh, it's, it's the last one that they published, uh, the Fraser Institute. And, and you can see that Venezuela is the last in the, in the whole uh, world. And that uh, even countries uh, like uh, Colombia, which have a relatively a good uh, framework are 57 in terms of uh, uh, oil uh, producing uh, jurisdictions, only, uh, you know, Trinidad uh, and Tobago and, and Guyana. Keep in mind that in the case of Argentina, here is during the Macri administration that the, the numbers were slightly higher. And, and here you have the, the, the Temer administration also in Brazil, uh, uh, not the, uh, the Lula and, and, and Rousseff. So, uh, but interestingly, because of the geopolitics of what's happening around the world, look at this uh, um, sort of uh, a, a, a uh, forecast of uh, uh, IHS, uh, now S&P, um, on what will happen in terms of the production of the major uh, international oil companies. By the way, not, not just the major, sort of a, a, a big sample of, significant sample of the biggest uh, uh, oil and gas uh, private uh, producers. And you can see that because in part of what is happening in Russia, the place where there's gonna be growth in, in these uh, companies' uh, production is uh, uh, Latin America, even more than, than, significantly more than in North America. And uh, you will see the reason why, I mean, the main uh, you know, uh, reason is, is Guyana to some extent, but then uh, also, the potential in, in uh, Brazil and Argentina. So let me um, just uh, show you the, the next one, which is the, the impact of the energy transition sort of in the region. As you know, there are widely different scenarios published by uh, different entities about what might happen with oil production in the future. And it's no different for, for the production in Latin America. The lower two scenarios that you see there are from the International Energy Agency uh, regarding uh, um, you know, net zero emissions. And so these are normative scenarios of what should happen, but not necessarily a, a, you know, a prediction of what can happen with, uh, with the current policies and technology. The, the top one is OPEC. And as you can see in that one, Latin America actually has a very big role to play in the, in the future in terms of increasing production. And the other three in the middle are the scenarios of uh, Reichstag energy uh, that include different sort of uh, uh, evaluations about what, uh, how fast the energy uh, transition happens. But in general, notice that even in the uh, scenario um, uh, of, of Reichstag, the, 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 the orange one, you see that Latin America produces more oil by 20, 
37 than it produces uh, today. So for the region, overall, the energy transition in terms of the oil industry is not going to uh, have a, a, a probably it's not going to have that significant uh, uh, effect until uh, later uh, later on and here you can see of course one of the, the biggest uh, sort of stories which is uh, Guyana Guyana uh, could uh, become uh, well it, it's going to become almost certainly the largest ore producer per capita on earth is uh, surpassing Kuwait and, and the uh, Emirates but uh, it, it, in, in any scenario, it looks like Guyana is going to be also one of the uh, uh, top three uh, or, or four producers in, in the region. And this is, uh, as you know, mostly discoveries by Exxon uh, with uh, two partners, Hess and uh, Sinoc from China. In terms of uh, Argentina, which is a country also with massive potential, in this case, in non-conventional resources in uh, shale and tight uh, oil and gas. Uh, you can see that Argentina has been a tremendous underperformer. Uh, after they privatized the oil industry in the 1990s and had a very good uh, performance, uh, 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 after the, the macro crisis of 2001, uh, Argentina has had a, a dismal uh, performance despite their, their significant uh, potential. And just recently, because of the uh, uh, development in Vaca Muerta, there has been some leveling off of their production. And now there is a, a, a perspective that it might increase significantly. And here you can see that in most scenarios, Argentina as uh, its production increases uh, very significantly. And uh, in part, these scenarios have to do with the fact that other uh, non-OPEC uh, production around the world doesn't have that uh, you know, the, the, the prospects are not so great as, as you saw uh, before. Uh, of course, uh, you have the, 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 the Middle East producers in OPEC pro getting a, a larger share uh, during the energy uh, transition. Part of the reason why Argentina uh, can uh, will be able to develop at least some of Vaca Muerta, despite all their uh, problems in terms of institutions and macroeconomics, is that the type of investment of shale is a short cycle investment where the risks are uh, much smaller than in other uh, longer term, bigger uh, uh, projects. Uh, Brazil, as I mentioned, the most successful uh, country in the region, uh, a country that in the 19, you know, 90s, nobody who would have believed would become the, the largest producer in Latin America. They could be producing much more than they are producing because of their policies of, uh, uh, you know, during Lula and Rousseff that, that basically made uh, uh, Petrobras again uh, the, the main player in the, in the, in the pre-salt, forcing it to be the operator. But uh, those policies have been uh, uh, changed, and so uh, they uh, uh, have a much better uh, environment right now. And of course, the elections will matter in terms of what happens in, in Brazil. Uh, but here again, you can see that except for the very uh, tough climate uh, 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 scenarios, Brazil's production is uh, geared towards uh, reaching levels of close to 6 million barrels in the next uh, um, uh, decade. Uh, the case of Mexico is a, an unfortunate case of, uh, you know, very significant decline in production, basically because of their, once their Cantarell field uh, uh, was depleted and, and uh, they, their production has not uh, ever uh, been able to, to uh, be only, not only replace uh, reserves, but uh, production has tended to decline, or, although recently has been a little, uh, relatively stable. Their oil opening was too late, too little, too late. And I have to say, uh, disappointing also in terms of their the performance of their uh, exploration. Uh, and, and so far, even though Mexico does have some potential, and you can see here that in some of these scenarios, like the OPEC one, they uh, uh, believe that eventually uh, Mexico will uh, could recover in, in the case that the price of oil is uh, high enough and the production, uh, the output of Mexico is necessary because of the lack of supply in other areas, but uh, otherwise we see a, a decline in the Mexican oil uh, industry. And finally, uh, Venezuela. Um, uh, David explained it very well what has happened in, uh, recently, just to keep in perspective in Venezuela, uh, after uh, you know the, the oil opening in the 1990s when production recovered very significantly uh, with the Chavismo, there has been a, a, a permanent decline that accelerated 
dramatically with a decline in the price of oil and later with, uh, uh, with sanctions. Um, and uh, uh, that has meant that since the COVID pandemic started, there have been no oil rigs in operation in, in, in Venezuela drilling new wells. And partly you can see why, because let me show you here, Venezuela had a lot of spare capacity because they were not being able to sell uh, the oil uh, because at the low prices of the, of the two, 2020s and with, because of the lack of the problems of getting diluents and the problems of, uh, 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 as uh, uh, David explained with the secondary sanctions to uh, uh, Rovneft and, and the fact that many other companies decided not to buy, uh, they were sort of unable to uh, sell the oil when the prices recovered and they were able to uh, get the help of Iran for, for diluents and, and to, to export to China, that they were able to, to increase production. And you can see this here. And that's why uh, the spare capacity today is, is, is much lower. The spare capacity uh, today, it, it's, uh, I mean, the estimate of the uh, Energy Information Administration uh, is about 70,000 uh, barrels. You know, part of it is uh, the Boscan project, which is not operating uh, uh, right now. Um, but basically, what we um, what what we can see is that there is little upside uh, in the short term for Venezuela, and it will require very significant investment by Chevron if there is a license to get to uh, probably you know they could add a, a more than a hundred thousand barrels uh, after you know the the Boscan. Uh, uh, project uh, uh, goes online, which which will be a sort of relatively quick uh, recovery. Eventually, it will it will take uh, much longer. Um, but of course, we we have other questions on on what might happen with Venezuela. And I totally agree uh, with David that the opaque way in which today basically nobody uh, can trace, you know, how the the oil is exported and 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 I mean we know that goes to China, but I mean in terms of the flows of money, even within Venezuela, we know that in PDVSA, they don't know where the money uh, is. Uh, so uh, the, 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 there could be some significant improvements in if, if things are done uh, through regular uh, uh, channels. But I have to say that uh, there is also the potential that the whole sanctions regime uh, just unravels in the sense that uh, uh, countries like India and China uh, do not continue to abide by the threat, uh, you know, uh, threat of secondary uh, uh, sanctions. So we have to see how this uh, plays out. Uh, but uh, as as David says so far, uh, what seems likely is a license to Chevron in which uh, only a part will go back to PDVSA. Most of the resources will be to pay uh, Chevron uh, their their debt and, of course, for their operations. Uh, potentially, uh, 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 there are other problems that will have uh, some humanitarian side uh, to them. But so far, this is a, a limited uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 sort of relaxation or flexibilization of, of sanctions uh, that uh, that will uh, we will have to see how it plays out politically in terms of Maduro providing concessions to get something uh, more uh, significant in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very, very much, Dr. Monaldi. Well, uh, between David and, uh, and Francisco, we've got a lot of information. I was sitting here listening to both presentations and thinking, it's like trying to take a drink out of a fire hose. I'm just kind of overwhelmed by all the information. Sure, there are gonna be a lot of questions. So without further delay, let's move on to Jeremy Martin, who is the Vice President of Energy and Sustainability at the Institute of the Americas, which for you listening in who are not familiar with it, is an inter-American public policy think tank at the University of California, Santiago. Okay, Jeremy, please. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Blab. Good to see you again. And, and as a David and Francisco and Benigna, great to see you all. Um, it's uh, it's sort of the, uh, the Blues Brothers, right? Putting the band back together here, <clears throat> courtesy of Florida International University. So look, I'm gonna, uh, let me share a screen. I'm gonna take us in a very different direction. Um, and, and that is uh, to get more into specifically the energy transition. And so uh, I hate to do this, but we just got done talking about uh, amazing uh, opportunities around the oil and gas sector. And obviously, as Francisco highlighted, you have 
what's the major star uh, in the region, but really the world in Guyana. And I think the, 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 the factoid of becoming the world's largest per capita producer is remarkable um, in, in just a short period of time, right? I mean, what are we talking about? Just not even less than, uh, you know, in a decade, basically uh, becoming the world's largest per capita producer. But like I said, I'm going to take us in a very different direction. I want to get into energy transition. I want to talk about um, <laughs> some of the issues that uh, maybe affect the scenarios Francisco uh, shared and maybe some of the issues David talked about with regards to more of the energy security debate. Um, so energy transition in Latin America and the Caribbean, I'm going to get into uh, basically set the table uh, around sort of decarbonization, get into critical minerals and lithium, and then at the end talk a little bit about geopolitics of renewables or the, geo the, the sort of what some people are talking about is the evolution of geopolitics of energy uh, around some of the new sources and some of the new opportunities to deploy new technologies. So if we take as the starting point, I know this this comes uh, after 30 minutes of talking about oil in Venezuela and, 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 you know, becoming one of the world's largest oil producing regions, courtesy of a couple of countries in particular. And now we talk about, well, decarbonization is what the goal is of the energy transition. And we talk about the need to reduce the carbon energy of the primary energy matrix. These are things that are part of the international governance around climate change. These are things that have been looked at by a whole host of different international organizations. For this presentation, I'm primarily going to use International Energy Agency Net Zero 2050 uh, data points uh, to look at some of the issues around energy transition, where it affects the region, and, and what some of the particularities are. Uh, coming back to the, that IEA document and looking at what the IEA sets forth and the reason they've created this Net Zero 2050 uh, pathway is the fact that globally, three-fourths of, of, of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are derived from the energy sector. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, if we want to talk about decarbonization, if we want to talk about averting climate disaster, if we want to talk about reduction of emissions, the first place where, of course, we've already begun to focus but need to continue to focus is in the energy sector. This obviously points to decarbonization. The power market, that's underway. That's something that's already happening. And if you look at the IEA chart, you see uh, you know, there already has been a significant global uh, deployment of wind and solar. Um, that's going to continue. There's, there's, there's only going to be a, a, you know, growth in wind and solar, but perhaps geothermal, offshore wind, some newer technologies uh, will continue. But I think also worth pointing out, and, and, and we look at uh, this chart and we look at the enormous growth in electric car sales, electric vehicle sales, that'll drive a little bit of the conversation around critical minerals that I'll share in a minute. But I think in Latin America and the Caribbean, we've done a fairly good job of decarbonizing the power sector. And by the way, there's the famous uh, point that Latin America has always had one of the cleaner power markets or power, power matrices, thanks to the legacy hydro uh, and enormous amounts of hydropower in many of the markets in the region, which gave it a, a huge leg up in terms of decarbonization of the power market. The ugly truth is while you see highlights of Costa Rica and Uruguay um, speaking to 100% renewables in the power market, those countries and the entire region have a tremendous dependency on fossil fuels for the transport sector, for oil products for transport. And so that's the final point of this slide is the need to decarbonize other sector and value chains in certain markets. But if we look at the energy pathway to net zero and particularly this IEA scenario, regardless of it's an IEA scenario or whatever the case may be, I think the starting point of any kind of decarbonization or detransition conversation has to be around the amount need of substantial quantities of critical minerals. On this chart in the middle, the IEA points to in their scenario something around a, 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 a 4x or a quadrupling of critical minerals demand in their 2050 pathway. So this is obviously one scenario, but if you look at many of the other scenarios and other outlooks and forecasts, the fact of the matter is the energy transition does not happen without enormous amounts of critical minerals, i.e. mining of materials and minerals that we don't have or don't have quantities of yet today. And I'll, I'll speak to why that's so important. Um, fact is just emphasizing this point also here, as we look to decarbonization and the role of electricity in our energy sector and energy matrix globally, but particularly in the region, you see, and particularly in the, the net zero 2050 IEA strategy, wind and solar and, and this, the, the, the real cost uh, declines on wind and solar uh, driving so much of, of the renewable deployment. And in this IEA scenario, going up to uh, 
to almost 80% of global power generation uh, by 2050. Um, but again, uh, the point of the energy transition and decarbonization around the climate emergency brings us to critical minerals. And it brings us to critical minerals because as these different uh, IEA scenarios point to, it's not just a lithium story, but there are a host of materials and minerals that today are not sufficiently uh, developed or not produced in sufficient quantities to meet the demand that's emerging and continue to emerge if we look back at that electric car sales growth, 18X, and if we look at um, stationary storage and some of the other uses for batteries, um, lithium ion batteries in particular. Final point is it's not just a lithium story, and I'll, I'll talk about lithium because that's particularly relevant in our region, but it's not just a lithium story. It's a graphite, it's a cobalt, it's a nickel, it's the rare earths. It's, it's a host of materials and mineral story. Uh, lithium probably gets the most attention, rightfully so, because at this point it is the key input. It's sort of like the flour if you're trying to make a cake. You can try to make the cake without it, but I'm not sure how good the cake will be. And then again, there are some gluten-free cakes out there, so maybe, maybe it is okay. Um, the important point to talk about when we look at lithium is it's, it's not a commodity. And so the idea that we talked about oil markets, um, lithium is first and foremost, a much smaller market still. And while I talk about demand outstripping supply and we talk about these enormous growth in demand, it's still a very small market per se, when we compare it particularly to the, the, the oil market. It's not a commodity, but it's hugely uh, important and it's hugely necessary. And, and the, the growing battery market is a chemical compound, lithium ion batteries. And on the right-hand side, you, you see a Wood Mackenzie, uh, a couple of different scenarios. They point to something like 20 new mines, the, the size of the largest lithium mines in the world being needed. Uh, Benchmark Mineral Intelligence has a 2035 outlook saying that there will be 59 new mines needed to meet demand growth. Um, you, you saw comments from the chairman of Toyota Motors this week being very forthright in saying he didn't believe that there would be um, enough supply. He saw that there will be, he, he, he perceived tremendous shortages in lithium, but other critical uh, minerals to be able to meet the kind of demand growth. And in fact, I, I think Toyota is taking a little bit of a, a mitigating position in terms of EV deployment because of that. Um, so the point is that regardless of with McKenzie, IEA, that, that all the forecasts at this point uh, and this, by the way, the benchmark includes some of the recycling. And so as you go further out and there's abilities to recycle some of the lithium for, for reuse, there still is an enormous amount of demand that outstrips supply. Um, so, so let's talk about, well, why is this relevant for Latin America and the Caribbean? Well, I'm sure most of you joining have heard about, you know, we talked about the lithium triangle and there's a huge amount of attention that gets bandied about, particularly with countries like Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. So here's the message I want to deliver about the lithium triangle or about the, the major potential developers of lithium resources in Latin America and the Caribbean. Only Argentina and Chile possess reserves. Bolivia's lithium, and if you see the chart on the right, yes, in terms of resources, in terms of the resource, quote unquote, below ground, enormous, massive, right? But at this point, given the current development model and given the current uh, development strategies of, of that country, they remain resources, not reserves. So they, the debate is around just exactly whether those resources can be turned into reserves and that is commercially viable for production. Um, Mexico, we see um, in this other chart, uh, one of the top uh, uh, resource holders in, in the world, uh, hugely important in Latin America and the Caribbean, but it, it is a, a very, nascent and, and, and there's one or two opportunities in Sonora that is being looking to, or the government's looking to develop. So if there's this enormous potential and there's this enormous opportunity, well, what's, what perhaps is holding it back? And, and, and one could argue, well, with this demand outstripping supply on a global level and chairman of Toyota worrying about tremendous shortages and all the different forecasts pointing to this huge demand supply gap, why isn't Latin America seizing the opportunity? Unfortunately, in some ways, it's a familiar story, particularly folks like Francisco have written enormous amounts of, of, of research about uh, issues around resource nationalism <clears throat> and how countries uh, develop models around extractive industries. So the fact of the matter is, again, in Latin America, the Caribbean, particularly in the Southern cone of Latin America, you might see opportunities around lithium being inhibited by above ground issues 
perhaps more importantly described the social license to operate because it's not just government and regulation, but there are legitimate real concerns from populations, from citizens around what the impacts of these kinds of projects and particularly with some of the current extraction methods of lithium in countries like Chile and Argentina and perhaps Bolivia. Um, the state intervention is, is certainly part of it. The resource nationalist posture is obviously affecting the opportunities of Mexico and Bolivia and to a lesser degree Chile. And the final point of challenge is, is that China dominates. And, and I'll get to more of that in a minute. But just quickly, because I really want to emphasize this point about the social license to operate, because I think it, it's something that we probably don't look at frequently enough and don't understand well enough. Uh, and when it comes to extractives, in this case, the, the critical minerals, but particularly lithium, this idea of what, uh, what some folks we all know what the IDB wrote about is the unwritten license of social approval accorded to extract the projects by citizens. So at the end of the day, what we're really talking about <clears throat> is the ability for projects, for governments, for all stakeholders, private, public, and NGOs and citizens to be able to agree on the pathway for development of this natural resource, of this, in this case, lithium. And so the role of governance, the role of the governments to be able to not only regulate and manage contracts, but to, to work with the, the, the private companies to actually develop the projects, whether it's regard to environmental mitigation, environmental management, particularly issues around water. But the overall development uh, model and in, in, in governance is hugely important. And this research that uh, colleagues at the IDB did on surveying and particularly focused on extractives in the Andean region point to the, the, the very important host of challenges. And what they really focused on was trying to understand public sentiment and really trying to understand, well, what is holding back or what are the issues that oftentimes cause these protesters we see in the photos on the right to not want to allow development or not want to give the social license to operate to these kinds of projects. Um, it's hugely complex, it's, it's, it's hugely complicated and, and deserves a lot more than one slide in, in my presentation, but we're restricted by time here, so I'll move on and we can come back to just exactly what the environmental issues and, and what I, I think we all refer to as social license to operate and why that's such a huge e element uh, to understand when we talk about lithium development, but all kinds of extractives and minerals in Latin America. So, so finally, I wanna focus on, on, on geopolitics. And, and, and I had mentioned earlier this point about China dominates and I'll come to just exactly what I meant. There's some interesting research done by, uh, by a group, uh, Megan O'Sullivan, David Sandalow, Indra Overland. Uh, it's a little bit dated, but it's still very interesting because what this talks about is, and David talked about the geopolitics around gas and about Venezuela. But what I think we wanna start thinking about is the geopolitics of energy evolving to more of a geopolitics of renewables as they call it, or perhaps the new geopolitics of energy. And there's, there's a, a, a long document that this is the cover here on the right. The critical materials and supply chains is one of their seven uh, points of focus. And that's what I wanna look at here. And the issue is, will there be some kind of cartelization uh, around maybe lithium around some of these other critical minerals where you have uh, the opportunity for uh, new players, new countries, new jurisdictions to all of a sudden express uh, uh, their ability to leverage access and leverage resources that heretofore really weren't part of a geopolitical discussion and certainly not part of a discussion around cartelization. Whether it's the opportunity to, to, to have a cartel that has anything around the weight or op a leverage of an OPEC, that's open to debate. But I think it's something to consider. But the main point of this critical mineral supply chains and what I think is relevant to understand it, and where I wrote earlier, China dominates is when it comes to the lithium ion battery supply chain, when it comes to the development of the entire supply chain from the upstream all the way on the far left of this chart from the lithium deposit to concentrate to the EV market. So the deployment of the vehicles themselves in the marketplace on the far right, there's only one jurisdiction, only one country in the world today that finds itself or we can find it in every segment of this critical mineral, but really lithium ion battery supply chain. And that's China. China is the only country, the only jurisdiction that is from the upstream, from the, 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 the material to the development of the compound, to the inputs into the battery, to the manufacturing of the battery and cell packs, to the actual EVs themselves, the only jurisdiction that is currently doing that. So this is hugely important because as we look at some other benchmark mineral intelligence numbers, 
it's not just that they are in all of those six segments of the value chain of lithium ion batteries, but they're in many of them to the degree of 60, 70, 80% of those six segments of the lithium ion battery value chain. China is, is absolutely dominating this space. It's a huge geopolitical issue. It's something that I think drove a lot of debate in Washington and perhaps one of the only areas of consensus we've seen in, 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 in the United States politically lately where folks agree we need in the United States a bipartisan approach. And, and some argue that's what the infrastructure bill and the Inf Inflation Reduction Act seek to do is to counter this current dominance of China. Obviously it's, it's much broader than critical minerals, but critical minerals and mining of, of these minerals and trying to bring that home or near shore onshore is part of, I would suggest, why the infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act were so broadly embraced across party lines. Uh, I think it's something that many folks agree on. The United States needs to do a better job uh, if we want to be able to, to, to secure some of the geopolitical uh, issues around this, particularly um, going forward. So, that's what I've got. I, I, I blew through that pretty quickly, but, uh, but I hope we can come back to it a little bit in the discussion. And uh, thanks again to everyone, FIU, and look forward to the conversation. I know Benigna is going to have some further comments before we uh, go to Q&A. Thanks. Jeremy, thank you so much for depressing us uh, with that presentation. I, uh, I'm with you. I understand the context and the challenges, and you've outlined them beautifully. And, uh, and I think most people recognize in the future, when we discuss energy, uh, particularly oil and gas, we have to put it in the context of what you just presented. Absolutely critically important. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Benigna Leis. Uh, she is a non-resident fellow in Latin American energy at the Baker Institute at Rice University. Uh, she worked for two decades in the private sector in energy in Mexico in particularly, uh, in particular, and she's going to be talking about energy uh, mining for alternative energy and hydrogen, which we haven't covered yet. So Benigna, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you so meeting. much for this uh, great opportunity to talk about the renewables and green hydrogen in Latin America. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, this is uh, a great opportunity to talk about um, what is happening and following up with um, Martin, uh, with Jeremy, and with what um, Francisco and David already said. I think that. Um, we have here, uh, Latin America has a lot to offer, but at the same time, there are many challenges. And that is um, probably an understatement. Uh, I am an, an economist by training, but I have been a business developer. And given the presentation that I will be focusing on hydrogen, I have to tell you that I am going to give you a uh, a, a high level presentation because I'm not going to get into the chemical aspects of hydrogen because this is a very much very complex um, area which I'm not trying to do, but I can tell you what is going on in the region. The next chart. As you can see, um, Latin America uh, has is a very diversified region uh, from Mexico to the tip of the Southern Cone. Um, as we have already reviewed here, hydrocarbons um, are very significant and critical for the whole region and for the world with great expectations about what they are going to be doing in the future. Um, at the same time, uh, we have renewable, which is, um, is also um, critical for the planet. And here we have, I'm going to highlight the countries that uh, are the most significant. However, these, these are uh, elements that are present in many other countries, but in terms of hydro, as already was mentioned, Brazil is, has a, a major, major participation. Um, then you have biofuels. Again, Brazil has been dominant in biofuels for a long, for several decades. And the new um, 
energy that has been in progress after um, the solar panels and the wind uh, power became economically viable is actually the discovery that uh, you can actually generate electricity from solar and uh, from wind at, that has become economically viable around the world. In the region, actually Mexico had quite a bit of uh, capacity, this 11.9 terawatt uh, hours of generation with a capacity of 5.6 gigawatts, followed by Brazil, obviously the two biggest countries in the region, also with very significant uh, solar uh, capacity and generation, and followed by Chile, which is one of the, among those three countries, obviously is the very, this is much, much smaller. And similar situation with wind. Wind has been uh, a, a big um, contributor to the um, renewables. And again, Brazil has great winds, uh, and continuous rain, strong gusts like Mexico and Chile. And so these are uh, countries that are benefiting from their endowment. Uh, in the case of Mexico, as we as it happened with oil, unfortunately, it is the projects, the renewable projects have been uh, facing some difficulties recently, but they have the installed capacity. And geothermal is another source of uh, renewables in the region as well. And Jeremy already talked about the critical minerals for the energy transition, and I am highlighting here the region is specifically uh, copper, because you need copper for significant portion of copper for uh, manufacturing the electric vehicles and then for the trans electric transmission. So there is no question that copper is critical, as well as uh, Chile having the, is the first world producer of copper, followed by Peru. So the Southern Cone has a major role in the copper production worldwide. And lithium, um, Jeremy already talked extensively about that, and Chile is the second world uh, producer, and Argentina is the third, but in terms of reserves, that is, as Jeremy showed, is uh, the other way around. Um, in terms of iron ore, this is another mineral that is also very much needed for the energy transition, and it happens that Brazil Latin America is the second world producer. And nickel, that um, Jeremy also just mentioned, uh, Brazil happens to be the eighth producer in the world. So the region has everything that we need for energy. The reality is that we have um, many challenges and we will see how we continue to develop. The next one. And this one is the one I was referring to with the um, supply chain of hydrogen. What I wanted to show, with, show you is the fact that hydrogen is not new. Hydrogen has been produced for many decades, but it has been produced from fossil fuels, uh, from coal, uh, natural gas, and oil. And then recently, even the um, climate change uh, awareness uh, and there is the whole development of how to reduce or capture the carbon emissions. And as a result of that, uh, for example, carbon capture has become one of the technologies to be used for uh, the hydrogen that is being, still being produced with, from fossil fuels. So then we have come up with the, all these names to identify the fossil fuels um, hydrogen that can be gray or it can be blue if carbon capture takes place. And then um, you go into the storage has one of the uh, big advantages is that you can store it, but it has a still a major problem which is under development right now is how to transport the hydrogen. That is one of the issues at this time for to, to distribute and to get it to the end users. So the big advantage we have in Latin America and the countries we have just uh, looked at is that we have great um, 
one of the best solar radiation and the best wind, uh, strong gas and strong winds in the region. And those countries happen to be um, primarily uh, as um, Chile um, with the desert is the best radiation in the world. And then um, the, the strongest winds are exactly in Patagonia. So for Argentina and Chile, and then the winds also in, in Uruguay and in Brazil, wind and solar are very significant. And there you have to produce hydrogen, the major components, the most, the highest component is exactly electricity, which represents about 60% of the total cost. And the current situation is such that um, given the ability to produce this solar and wind power, uh, in particularly uh, in Chile and Brazil is doing the same thing. We, we will look at some of the pilot projects that they are looking at. They, um, they are making major um, inroads in reducing the cost to become competitive with the um, hydrogen being produced from fossil fuels, which of course, the whole concept is that that is, should be more expensive than uh, green hydrogen produced with renewable. So um, this is the big picture here about what it takes to produce hydrogen and the technologies that are currently being used for um, producing hydrogen are all these very um, uh, sophisticated names from my perspective. You have alkaline, you have the polymer electrolyte membrane technology, you have an anion exchange membrane technology and a solid oxide elect electrolyzers technology. These last two are really uh, in the uh, experimental phase, but the ones that are currently being used is this alkaline and the polymer electrolyte membrane. Those are the technologies that are currently being used. The next one. So how is the regional energy transition going? So most countries in the region appear committed to actually uh, reduce their uh, carbon emissions. Despite the fact that actually the Latin America as a whole contributes only about 5% of the total emissions worldwide. Where the situation comes, comes up to be quite different is at the uh, country level. Because actually the, um, the fact is that the region uh, depends on fossil fuels for about 70% of the energy matrix. While, for example, Brazil has only 50% of their um, energy matrix is fossil fuels because of their hydro biofuels and now the uh, solar and wind. So the countries that are um, benefiting and are making major efforts in this uh, new uh, technology on the green hydrogen include countries like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Uruguay, which already have pilot projects in progress. And we are going to focus here in looking at two examples, just um, as we see how these countries are dealing with this new technology, because green hydrogen development and derivative products reducing fossil fuel consumption, green methanol, synthetic gasoline, green ammonia to be used as a renewable fuel and fertilizer among other uses are critical um, as if we really want to um, reduce carbon emissions. So I have selected these two countries because Brazil and Chile, because they have in common um, their mining activity, which actually that um, gives them the, um, I guess the common, um, effort to actually why they, they can use green hydrogen in their mining operations to reduce carbon emissions. And both um, countries and iron ore and copper uh, 
iron ore in Brazil and steel manufacturing is one of the major uh, emitters of carbon, uh, green, uh, greenhouse gases. And in Chile, the copper mining is also one of the activities that generate the most significant amount of uh, carbon emissions. The next one. So going to Brazil, what is Brazil doing in terms of the, what are the highlights here? Um, as I mentioned, the Brazilian sector, the Brazilian energy sector is low carbon because with close to 50% is um, in, included in the, um, is, is a, re a renewal, which includes sugarcane, biomass, hydro, wind, and solar power. While the, the world is in the world, the um, renewables is only 13.8%. So Brazil carbon emissions represent only 1.3% of the total in the world versus the United States is 138 and China is 30.7. Actually, they are the ones based on the numbers in 2020. They're the ones with the highest emissions in the world. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, Brazil is the second worldwide producer of iron ore and is still manufacturing after Australia. And the companies that are operating in Brazil in, in, in the uh, iron ore and in the steel manufacturing, I include uh, Vale, which is the Brazilian company, and BHP, which is an Australian company, and their board of directors are already committed to um, reduce carbon emissions in their operations, which are, have been called uh, scope one, two, and three of um, emissions. And you will, if, if you um, let me tell you this, what are these scope one, two, and three emissions? The one, the scope uh, one, are the ones that really that directly um, have to do with the operations in the mine. Number two are the ones that have to do with the uh, energy that is being used, and number three are, are the ones that are being generated by the supply chain. So obviously that one, the third one is the most difficult one, but they actually the Inter-American Development Bank has uh, been working with um, the, the countries in the region to develop the methodology to actually measure those emissions as well. So the, con the concept here is the, that green hydrogen could play a key role in reducing this mining uh, oper mining operation emissions. So that is the, I guess, the driver here in Brazil as well. The next one. So what is the government doing um, about hydrogen? And so Brazil issue this uh, national hydro hydrogen program where they want to really help to mobilize public, private and academic sectors and international cooperation to accelerate the development of a green hydrogen market. So we'll, we will have some examples here of what has this meant for the country. So the Ministry of Mines and Energy in Brazil has uh, concluded the obvious is that Brazil has a great potential to stand out in this technology and be an energy exporter because 80% of the electricity generation is from renewable sources in Brazil. So they have what it takes to actually be, uh, contribute to green hydrogen. But they also, on the other hand, they are using, the, using uh, hydrogen presents major technological challenges and economic challenges because as I said, the, the cost of the electrolyzer, which is the equipment required to, to make, to manufacture the, the hydrogen is also under development and is, the market is relatively small so far. The expectations are that that market will grow as the US uh, is promoting as well the um, 
production of hy the green hydrogen, so electrolyzers, there will be a bigger market. And as a result of that, their cost is likely to come down. So they, um, what Brazil has done is to actually um, have signed several MOUs, actually many MOUs, this with the purpose of with the purpose of um, developing the uh, pilot projects. So we have here uh, projects in Sao Paulo and in the state of Ceará. So they are really moving forward with pilot projects to test their ability to develop this uh, green hydrogen. The next one. Okay, so going to Chile, uh, again, it's a very uh, a small country in contrast with Brazil, it's a 10th of the population. Um, the however, the, um, energy consumption per capita is a lot higher than in Brazil. Um, but at the same time, because they have this very significant copper mining, these mining operations um, offer the opportunity to develop a local market, a domestic market for hydrogen. And again, the companies operating uh, the mining operations, Codelco, BHP, Anglo-American, are committed to reduce carbon emissions. Again, the same as COP1, 2, and 3. The next one. So here is the, the, uh, what the government has done. And what has been very interesting here is that uh, Chile issued the national energy policy, including the green hydrogen strategy in 20, uh, 2020. And currently it's been, uh, the government is actually uh, updating that uh, strategy to, to have a specific, a specific action plan. And again, because Chile has, as I already mentioned, the best uh, radiation in the planet and the very strong winds in the Patagonia. There are projects, pilot projects that are actually uh, installed in these uh, places um, because the, um, the cost is competitive and it's expected to be more competitive. And the interesting part in this case is that the government, the public and the private sectors have been working together since the beginning. And the last one. So um, I just, uh, I know we're running out of time here. So I just want to show you here that there are more, Ch Chile has many uh, pilot projects. However, the most interesting part here, because it's very recent, it is an, this Antofagasta Green Hydrogen Mobile Plant. It's a pilot project that was inaugurated last week by President Boris, um, where this uh, pilot project uh, is, has the purpose to identify the best potential location for a hydrogen plant to use optimal solar radiation. So they are uh, really working very hard in making this uh, possible. And as I said, this was inaugurated just last week. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Okay, well, Benita, thank you so much. All the presenters, thank you so much. Uh, let me jump right in here and uh, ask Alex, do you have any questions on that in that chat room for any particular one of our presenters? Yeah, so we have a, one that's directed at either Professor uh, Dr. Minaldi or uh, David Vaughn. And uh, the question is, is this. Uh, Venezuela's cross-border offshore gas fields with Trinidad seem to be often overlooked. Both countries signed a unitization treaty that apparently isn't being implemented. Is there any realistic prospect that the Lauren Manatee gas field will be jointly developed in the near future? This is coming from Blas Ichaso. Uh, you want me to start? I mean, uh, there is another question, by the way, by Carlos Bellorín, uh, similar, and, and David can comment on this too. I think uh, as, as the 
uh, but your in-question uh, states, uh, first, what we will see is, is Dragon, uh, uh, the field that is uh, closer uh, to the viscous uh, platform on the Trinidadian side. That, that will be probably what happens first. And as David said, maybe this will take, if everything goes well and the license is given uh, about three years to see the first gas going to uh, to Europe. Then, as David mentioned, there is this other potential of collecting gas from the northern Monagas fields. Um, I think that's less likely to happen uh, because it, uh, you know, has much more risk and, and, and you know, there are a bunch of issues to, to, to get solved uh, uh, there, you know, and as David mentioned, the issues in Venezuela about uh, even you know basic uh, security uh, uh, you know in the in terms of uh, st st stealing uh, equipment etc is so dire that you know I, I I'm much less confident that that this would uh, would happen but, but eventually if the dragon works out then I think we might see some thinking about Lauren Manatee but uh, I don't know David if you want to add something no, sure. I mean, okay, so Blas, uh, first of all, that that unitization treaty between Trinidad and Venezuela was actually dissolved in, in February of 2020. Um, it, it, it was apparent to the Trinidadians that they would be unable to jointly develop that, uh, that shared block, uh, given U.S. sanctions, and uh, in full agreement with the Venezuelans, the, the treaty was dissolved, and uh, Trinidad is developing Manatee uh, now on its own. Um, <clears throat> uh, that doesn't mean that something can't be done jointly. Uh, I, I think there's there's still huge prospects there. Uh, but until sanctions are resolved, uh, uh, I think Chevron, uh, who's the who has the rights to the Loran field uh, under a non-associated gas license, is not going to be able to do much. Um, uh, about it. Um, as Francisco mentioned, the Dragon Field is, is really sort of on our short list. It's an incredible opportunity, um, uh, uh, really easily able to tie into Trinidadian transportation infrastructure and, and, and bring that gas uh, to, to market. So um, I, I would say uh, uh, slow going on Loran Manatee, uh, more potential on, on Dragon. And um, I agree 100% with Francisco's assessment of gas collection uh, with potential export. Um, however, it still sort of has to be one of my favorite. Um, it's such low hanging fruit uh, that that gas is there for the taking with very little investment. Um, yeah, some challenges uh, in terms of transportation development onshore in Venezuela. The connection is still short. Um, in, in any case, there is a long history of um, complicated negotiations between Trinidad and, and, and Venezuela on uh, eventual gas imports. And I don't expect uh, a future uh, negotiation to be that much easier, but really uh, kudos to uh, Prime Minister Raleigh and Minister Young from Trinidad and Tobago. They have been on the road uh, hitting Washington, hitting Europe, hitting Venezuela, uh, trying to move this gas uh, to Trinidad for the economic benefit of their country and uh, for the market. Fantastic. Uh, from there, then, let's uh, go to questions more, uh, a little more international. So Marvin Wiley asked, how can Latin America and the Caribbean be a key partner in helping Europe with its current energy crisis in the short term and long term, given LATAM's own challenges. Uh, Dr. Minaldi, you had spoken about uh, Guiana briefly. I know that Guiana is uh, one of the, at least I think about like 50% of its own oil experts are moving towards Europe. Um, maybe you can talk about that relationship or any other partners that are moving, uh, moving their exports over to, to Europe. Yeah, I mean, in terms of oil, the, the two places are Guyana and Brazil. Uh, that's where production is, mm -hmm. is, is going up. Uh, uh, elsewhere, production is, uh, you know, going down. Venezuela, uh, as David mentioned, it depends a lot on, on what happens with, uh, with the sanctions and with the politics in, in Venezuela. I don't think in the short term, Venezuela is, uh, is going to be a, a relevant, but it could potentially, I mean, it has these massive uh, resources and, and potential. And, and on the gas side, unfortunately, uh, you know, the two places are this project uh, through Trinidad in Venezuela and uh, Argentina, but in Argentina, it will take, I think, uh, a, a long while, as you know, uh, it's amazing, but Latin America basically 
including Trinidad, you know, a Caribbean country. Uh, basically, you have Peru's Camisea's project uh, that exports mm -hmm. and almost nothing else. So, uh, I mean, we have within the region in Bolivia, for example. But so, so Latin America is a significant underperformer in terms of, uh, you know, gas. Uh, and 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 of course, the current price environment might get some things uh, uh, going, but uh, it's not. Uh, particularly relevant for the for the picture of what's happening in Europe. Great. Does anybody else uh, want to give yeah, a response to I, that? Or? I, I could say something about renewables and the interest that um, actually for the long term, Europe has had for um, supporting the development of the uh, pilot projects and the memorandum memorandum of understanding that have been signed have been signed with Rotterdam and with uh, Germany to actually develop hydrogen to go into those economies. So um, that is in the long term. Obviously, um, Europe is interested also in diversifying their energy mat matrix and, and reducing their carbon footprint. So um, they have been very active in supporting those projects in, in Chile and, and Brazil and um, Argentina as well. So, yeah, I would, Alex, I would just add that, you know, it's, there, there's no short term solution for Europe's crisis coming from Latin America. There may be a medium long term, whether it's hydrogen via some kind of vector ammonia, there's different ways of looking at the hydrogen potential, but, and then the gas, I mean, if Argentina had gotten serious about exporting LNG five years ago, they would have been a solution to Europe's current crisis, but <laughs> They didn't, and they still aren't going to be able to develop the kind of infrastructure needed to export gas. Um, they can barely move the molecules to the degree that necessary to the Buenos Aires market, let alone uh, developing the export capacity. I mean, we can always hope, but for the current near-term crisis, the next year or two in Europe, no. not from Latin America, sorry. Yeah, and hindsight is kind of 2020 in that regard. Nobody can really predict a, a global right. crisis like another Russian invasion, you know? Uh, so. All right, let's do a kind of a combination of, of two more questions before we finish off. We're, we're over time by a little bit. And these, I, I think, are, I think anybody can answer, but maybe Benigna can offer some key insights. Um, Andrew Baker had asked, what is the outlook for ENP in Mexico post AMLO? And then Daniel Guevara asked, <laughs> Daniel Guevara asks, uh, key success of hydrogen policy in the long term. So any any insights on on how to, I guess, use hydrogen as a as a primary energy source or, or any policies that might encourage countries to to shift towards uh, a more hydrogen centric approach? Uh, yeah, that that is why one of the challenges for the whole region is the development of the uh, regulatory framework that would actually um, allow this um, the, the development of this uh, new industry because in reality uh, in the case of Chile this is clearly a, a new industry and Chile has the advantage which has been a disadvantage for a, forever is that they don't have hydrocarbons of to speak of so they really needed um, a different source of high, of energy and hydrogen and renewables have become that new source of energy for Chile and but they need the regulatory framework that will allow that development uh, in a systematic fashion. And with Mexico, um, I was personally very involved in the regulatory framework that allowed the opening of the oil and gas sector in Mexico. But we know that um, even uh, political changes that can change drastically as well and, and you can actually shut down or close down all those um, or modify all that uh, regulatory framework that was in progress. So, so it is, again, part of the above ground risk that the region faces over the years, has been facing over the years and probably will continue to face over the years to come. Mm -hmm. Not wanting to sound like a pessimist, but uh, I'm mm -hmm. gonna take the prerogative of the chair to just summarize what I just learned. And that is we have huge challenges ahead of us uh, to meet our alternative energy <clears throat> goal and to get the carbon neutrality. It's not gonna be easy. And we're gonna have to witness uh, a lot of advances in new technology 
to make things like hydrogen really uh, commercially and new battery technologies are gonna be required. The expansion of the mining sector. So these challenges are enormous and we're gonna have to see advances in technology if we pretend to meet these alternative energy goals. And I, I'm really so glad that um, Jeremy spent the time to talk about this context of just what a massive expansion of mining is going to be necessary and what's the carbon footprint going to be of that and what's going to offset it. So the whole energy picture today is so much more complex than it was when I started out in the oil business. We didn't have to worry <laughs> about retirement, <laughs> but today we do in spades. So thank you all very much. I really Can I just offer one note of, of, of sure. I would say, I think positive, I, I am very hopeful in terms of sustainable aviation fuels from hydrogen, I think Latin America and the opportunity there is going to be more of a near-term opportunity. And I think when we talk about transport, we oftentimes don't think about air transport, but I think that's an area where Latin America it could certainly be really, really impactful in terms of uh, sustainable aviation fuels. So sorry, I wanted to be positive to end here. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Ever the optimist, Jeremy. <laughs> Someone has to be. <laughs> thank you all very much. And thank, thank you. All you thank, you. And Alex, thank you. Thank you for all your work and putting this together. Thanks for having us. Great to see everyone. Okay. Yes. Thank you. See you. Uh, and uh, just for everyone's uh, awareness, the, the recording for, for this event is going to be on the Gordon Institute YouTube page, as well as on the Security Research Hub website, which is uh, srh.fiu.edu. Uh, so yeah, perfect. Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your rest of your week, great weekend, and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch soon. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.